Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bella, um, you mentioned uh, the rebalancing in your testimony, and um, one of the things I'm interested in, well, first, uh, you know, this discussion in general, Washington State, you know, I, I like to say this is Washington and people like to regulate, but in Washington, my Washington, we like to innovate. And the innovation that we're doing in healthcare isn't just about savings for us. I mean, we've had to do it <laughs> over decades. And we've proven that innovation does drive better outcomes and lower costs. So what we don't, what we want is we don't want to be held back because we've had to do it to guarantee care. Uh, so I just want my colleagues to know as challenging as these things might seem to us, it's, it's an ethos now. It's, it's, it, it's beyond an ethos. It's, we've proven success. We want to move forward and we hope the rest of the country will do the same because we're tired of paying for more expensive health care for the rest of the nation as well and having our system jeopardized by the fact that we get paid less. And so people don't want to practice there, but we've still innovated. Anyway, my point is uh, the rebalancing that you mentioned to community-based care uh, and the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. So we've already shown savings in rebalancing from nursing home care to community-based care. How do you think that rebalancing fits with this concept of the dual eligibles? How would you integrate those two? Well, the rebalancing is, is I mean, a, a critical part of, of what we're doing here. I mean, the point is the system has an institutional bias. And so what we're trying to do is make sure we, we, we kind of take that head on and promote models that are able to have financial accountability but also flexibility to provide services to people in settings that are least restrictive and most appropriate and in line with their choices. So this dual eligible, so this would be like you would coordinate with the rebalancing? Oh, well, if you're talking about the formal programs, like yeah, the, the, the program. balancing incentives and the, all of the other programs coming out of the Medicaid, yes. In, in any given state, we want to make sure that this is all coordinated and that we're looking at the same types of measures to look at indicators of success and understand that we're measuring dollars the same way as far as what's flowing to the community and what's flowing to institutions. So we're aligned with our colleagues back at CMS who are implementing the other you know, more formal rebalancing programs. It's a goal of these demonstrations so, and it is a measure that we look at as an outcome measure to understand how these demonstrations made an impact in terms of home and community-based services. And so for some place like Washington State that did, re that did rebalancing 20 years ago or something like that, how, uh, we would be able to better el be able to better integrate immediately a program on dual eligibility because the rebalancing is already so built into our system. Correct, and, and we and this goes into looking at the state-specific approaches. When, when we work with Marianne and others back in Washington, the opportunity for savings from rebalancing is different in a state like Washington that's 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 been doing it longer than in other states. And so we have to take all of that into account when we develop these models, and we understand how we're improving both quality and the rebalancing and the cost perspective. Miss Lindblad, uh, when we say communication to this population we get that it's a challenge, right? I mean, are, are we talking about uh, 72 different languages in our state? Is it, or is it more than 72? Well, it's, it, it, it's something like that. And we, what we do is we'll be targeting on the top, um, you know, 10 or 12, where most, of the pop, where most of the population is, and then bring in as needed for other languages, but making sure that all materials are, are translated into the top languages, and then assisting folks if we, um, if it's a very unusual or rare language. But when we, say absolutely. when we say communication, we get yeah. that this is, it's, it's huge for it us. Is. It is. As I said, with the most, most diverse zip code in the entire country, uh, and some of these school districts have already struggled mm -hmm. with it, so when it comes to the delivery system. But isn't the point here that right now, under the Medicaid population, they are not being managed in, in, the, in the sense you basically get a, as you were saying, medical home or a caregiver, to take a Medicaid population that could be a youth who is, you know, on SSI and mm -hmm. not doing a very good job of managing their own care, I guarantee you they're probably not, and all of a sudden now they have an advocate 
Yeah. Is that is that, that that's absolutely true. And when you think about the diversity of the population, not just in language, but in a variety of other ways in terms of what their healthcare needs are in the system. And you're right, now they'll have an advocate, someone that can help them navigate through often a very complicated, difficult system. So I would say that currently they are being bumbled around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't have anybody. They they are knocking their head against a you know the wall many times on this. And Mr. Uh, Batlitz, you you mentioned uh, that Oregon, I mean that Arizona saved $300 million in your switch to community-based care, uh, you know, going from 40% of your uh, community-based uh, care to 73%. For the elderly of, and physically disabled, that's correct, Senator. Which is great. Um, you know, we, we wish all states would move towards that rebalancing. But you were mentioning that to think that the, that Medicare alone could uh, be the sole answer for these dual eligibles. Uh, you know, you basically think that's wrong because there's no way dealing with this Medicaid population, particularly as it relates to community-based care. It's not a Medicare skill set in terms of it's something that the states have developed through their Medicaid programs for home and community-based placement and support. Uh, behavioral health is similar, where especially uh, members with serious mental illness, that, that's more a Medicaid skill set in terms of knowing what's needed for community supports and also arrive, providing an array of other services for individuals. Thank you. So I think, uh, I think Mr. Chairman, that uh, you know, these questions are the right questions. You're right, some states are further ahead, but I think you know, we should ask them about how to guarantee those safeguards. But uh, I think this is one of our uh, biggest challenges, but also biggest opportunities, to deliver better care and to be more cost effective in how we deliver it. So I hope that, that we'll build in whatever safeguards we need to build in. Um, and, and I think you're right, you know, build them in. <laughs> but just even in our rebalancing uh, proposal that was part of the uh, health care law, I think now what are we up to? Like eight or, nine, eight, eight or nine states have now said, okay, we want to try to do rebalancing, and some of them I never would have predicted. Uh, so the good news is, is that uh, uh, we have models that we can follow and we can keep pushing the envelope in various stages here. So I thank the chair.